tonight. The plot is real. A group of Conservative MPs and former advisers want Rishi Sunak gone. We'll tell you how they plan to do it. Team Rishi are trying to flush out the traitors. One has been revealed. A former advisor described in Whitehall as the young Dominic Cummings. Our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, will tell you why tonight the plotters are feeling emboldened. Also tonight, the foul-mouthed WhatsApp messages from Nicola Sturgeon about Boris Johnson during the pandemic. The government announces another crackdown on so-called zombie knives. Labour says it's too little, too late. Ahead of Holocaust Memorial Day this weekend, I'll speak to Dame Maureen Lippmann. She tells me that nowhere is a safe place to be Jewish at the moment. And as a journalist here in Westminster bids to become a Labour MP, we'll have a little quiz for you on some other names you might recognise who crossed the divide from hack to parliamentarism. All that and more with James Starkey and John McDonnell, who will be with us for the next hour. It's Thursday. I'm Sophie Ridge, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Hello, good evening. It's hard to overstate just how bad things are looking for the Conservatives right now. As an election approaches, the received wisdom is that the polls should narrow. Well, if anything, the Labour lead is widening. And something else is going on too, something quite significant. You see, when Rishi Sunak first became Prime Minister, you know, in the days of his swishy videos with hoodies and sliders, he was seen as an asset to the damaged brand of the Conservative Party. But now that's changed. In October, according to polling by More in Common, 37% said Rishi Sunak was an asset to the Conservatives, 33% didn't. But in January, it's more than flipped. Only 26% see Sunak as an asset and 43% say he isn't. So you can see why some Conservatives are questioning whether a presidential-style election campaign with Rishi Sunak as a focus is a good idea. And some more restless party members might feel like there's nothing to lose with a change of leader. Things can't get any worse. Now, the MP Simon Clark, an ally of Liz Truss, is one calling for the PM to go. No one likes the guy who's shouting iceberg, he said. But I suspect that people will be even less happy if we hit the iceberg. As one political hat put it, I think if I was such a strong supporter of the PM outlived by lettuce, I'd be careful about being the guy who shouts iceberg. So Simon Clark's one-man rebellion sparked more ridicule than revolution this week, and Westminster moved on. Well, some people in Westminster moved on, but not our deputy political editor, Sam Coates, who's been doing a bit of digging and discovered the plot is very much still alive. Incredible as it might seem in election year, once again, there is a plot, an attempt to unseat the Prime Minister by fellow Conservatives, the very people he's trying to get re-elected. This group, mostly working for free, believe the pain, the chaos of changing leader for a third time in this parliament would be better for the Conservatives on election day than sticking with Rishi Sunak. And we know that because supporters of Rishi Sunak came up with a plan to flush out plotters, to unsettle them, to start dripping out names starting with the youngest, the man people around Whitehall refer to as the young Dominic Cummings. This is Will Dry, brilliant, obsessive, determined, and that's just the view of the officials that he worked with. He's only 25, but he's been on a hell of a political journey. We've interviewed him on Sky when he was campaigning for a second referendum. Just watch this. Hi, I'm Will Dry, uh, and I'm co-founder of Our Future, Our Choice, which is a group of young people calling for a people's vote on Brexit. But despite what you just saw, he still worked for Michael Gove and then Rishi Sunak in number 10 as his pollster, but quit just before the new year. He wrote, I resigned before Christmas after steadily becoming more dispirited. Everyone in this country can see just how colossal the challenges that we face are. Sadly, it became clear to me we weren't providing the bold, decisive action required to overcome those challenges. This gave the plot fresh momentum. Hours after this, the man on the left went public. Simon Clark said that the Tories under Rishi Sunak were meekly sleepwalking towards avoidable annihilation. And he joined Andrea Jenkins here, who called for him to go in November. 
Now, nobody else has gone public, but I understand the plotters aren't worried about a lack of momentum. They just think the spectacle of Tory MPs tearing into the Prime Minister on the news in such great length at this stage is enough. Now, we first thought that there was a plot afoot because of this, last week's mega poll, seat by seat, showing the scale of the impending doom facing the Conservative Party, and all given the seal of approval by the darling of the Tory right, Lord David Frost. Now, the YouGov poll was paid for, we're told, by the Conservative Britain Alliance, a mysterious group of disaffected Tory donors. Unhappy donors cause trouble. Just ask Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. And from the moment it came out, Tory headquarters has been desperate to know exactly who or they are. But the real problem is these people, disaffected Tory MPs. We know from just last week, 60 of them are unhappy enough to defy the Prime Minister in the voting lobbies. And that's more than the 53 letters of no confidence needed to trigger a ballot on his leadership. And we also know that this plot is MP-led. And, and they think time is on their side. Now, I know the plotter's plan. It's a war of attrition against Rishi Sunak. They think the polls won't improve. They think the Prime Minister won't seize the moment and drip, 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 events will help them every step of the way. Possible February 15th by-election losses. Will the March 6th budget be underwhelming? Will the Rwanda bill cause more pain in the Commons? Then there's the May 2nd local and mayoral elections. Drip, drip, bang, is what they say. The plotters aren't sure their plan will work, but they think the Tory party is dicing with extinction if they don't give it a go. So better to try whatever the pain threshold this endeavour requires. But can he really withstand 11 months of this? Well, Sam is here with us. Sam, how serious is this plot? So I think over the last few days, allies of Rishi Sunak have been trying to massively play it down, saying nobody seemed to follow Simon Clarke. It's a, a few people here and there, the vast majority of the Conservative Party clearly behind Rishi Sunak. It's really serious. It's really serious for two reasons. First of all, we know there are uh, uh, quite a lot of people who, whilst not prepared to do it now, are prepared to challenge the Prime Minister. We saw that in the voting lobbies. And secondly, I think it's serious because of what we're not seeing from Rishi Sunak. There's a vacuum. There's a big, big vacuum that MPs, Tory MPs feel, of um, in the place of a Prime Minister who could be setting the agenda, uh, leading from the front, changing the conversation to the betterment of the Conservative Party. It's not happening. And whether it's the lack of announcements, the lack of visibility, the lack of being able to change things for the better. Nothing that Rishi Sunak has done this week has particularly taken off, gone well. Nothing the government has done uh, has made a mark. You end up having the weird spectacle of the Conservative Party following Labour policy announcements on things like uh, knife crime. And, and, and all of this is causing jitters. And, and there's so little in the calendar. And because we are coming up to an election, there aren't big bills, there aren't big moments in Parliament beyond the Rwanda uh, uh, project and the budget uh, really to point to. And without that sense of leadership, that's where I think kind of discontent could grow. The assumption of the plotters is the problem is Rishi Sunak himself and that people will see it. We'll at, see if that's right. At the same time, though, you've got Simon Clark, you've got Andrew Jenkins. I mean, I'm no mathematician, but that's not enough to topple Rishi Sunak. Nowhere near it. No. And everyone else has come out saying, yeah, we back him. Even Liz Truss made it clear she backs him. No, and, and as, at the, as I was saying at the end of that little, um, little guide to the plot, the plotters themselves think it's more likely than not that they fail, mm -hmm. but they think that Rishi Sunak's approach is going to take them to a worse defeat, so they might as well try. The most likely outcome of all of this madness, the kind of memento-style screen with the, with the links, is just that the Conservative Party gets itself in a worse and worse and worse position, but Rishi Sunak isn't overthrown. But that's just the Conservative Party in 2024. What's your take on election timing, Sam? So, it's hard, right? The Prime Minister says that he is minded to go in the second half of the year, and we think that that's a, a date around, uh, around, around November. But the problem is nobody in Westminster buys it. I mean, I was talking to officials today, I talked to Tories, and, and first of all, Rishi Sunak's clearly keeping May open. He hasn't shut it down. Secondly, Without an agenda, how does he keep going till November? And I think that everything that we've just been discussing, this plot, which is not going away, and his life can clearly, easily be made a misery by a small number of people who have good tactical brains, lots of briefing, the odd nasty quote, the odd horrible story in the Sunday newspapers, all it takes to stop him ever getting lift off. 
can he really withstand that to November? Isn't there a sort of, you know, a fly to Switzerland option where he just goes earlier? Uh, brave Prime Minister to go to the polls when they are looking in the way. But it might just are. be much more painful to stay. Uh, Sam, thank you very much uh, indeed. Sam Coates there uh, with the full expose uh, on the plots. Uh, right, let's bring in our duo uh, for tonight, shall we? Joining us are the former Conservative Special Advisor James Starkey and the Labour MP John McDonnell. Great to have you both on the programme. James, as someone who is very well connected in Conservative circles, how seriously are you taking this plot? Well, I think in terms of, as Sam laid out, it should be taken seriously because they're quite able, they're able to, con to inflict damage. So since the beginning of the year, it's probably now for two weeks been one of the main topic of conversations. We had the poll that Sam mentioned, which dominated the news agenda really for a day or two, Simon Clark, and then today the discussion about the advisors. So it needs to be taken seriously in that. But I think the interesting thing is the, analysis, the broad analysis is perhaps not that disagreed upon, which is the Conservatives are likely headed for a defeat. The big question really is, the division is perhaps more about what can be done about that, is that some people want the Prime Minister to be more bold and still think there's a chance, if you look at the economic figures, they're going to improve. And some people, and it seems very few people at the moment, particularly MPs, as you said, only two publicly said anything, think that maybe a change of leader would lead to success. So that's really the big division that's going on, I think. I mean, you've had your fair share of, of parliamentary battles, <laughs> I think it's fair to say, of plots and, plots, you know... Coups, uh, exactly, coups, yeah. all, the whole lot. Where, where, where would you rate this one? I think, I think it's serious. I think you're right, it's serious. His Senate's judgment is if it comes to May and he gets hammered in the local elections in May, which he's likely to be, he's a goner anyway. So I think he may well want to pull stumps before that and maybe tell them, right, we're going to go for a May election. That might save him, but I'm not sure. And also, I have a rule of thumb about Tory plots. It's always, where's Michael Gove in all of this? Because mm. he's usually the one who will find, identify. He's usually a kingmaker these days as well. But I don't, I don't think it will rescue them anyway, because it's it's, you can't just blame Sunak for what's happening at the moment. You know, you've had Cameron and Osborne, years of austerity. You then have Theresa May fumbling it. Then you have Johnson and then Trust, disaster after disaster, and things are in crisis. And, and I think people are saying, hang on, there's a, there's a country to run here. You're fighting amongst yourselves. I think the country would just want a great relief to get the election over with and move on. Where would you put yourself? Do you think it is look, nothing, to lo nothing to lose? You know, let, let's change the leader. He, he, he's not uh, someone who's got great approval ratings. He, the polling is really poor. Or do you think... Actually, after so many changes of leader, the last thing the public would forgive is, is another leadership contest. I, would, I think the last thing the public would forgive is the leadership mm. contest. The country's been through a lot. Uh, Covid, obviously the Prime Minister played a big role in that as Chancellor. He inherited a situation from the last Prime Minister, from Liz Truss, that he's, he had to build. He's had to do much what the Labour leader, Keir Starmer, did, which is rebuild a party or rebuild its credibility with the electorate. And that's been his focus on the first year. And part of that was always going to cause a bit of difficulty because it was just about going quiet and focusing on delivery. And that is what Rishi's team have been doing for the last year. So I think, I, I really don't think the electorate will forgive another round of kind of Tory infighting through a leadership contest. And, and so I, I think the party needs to get behind the Prime Minister and make the best of it. I want to know for James, given everything you said about a plot. Do you think the plotters are mad? Do I think they're... Mad. Uh, I don't know if you used the phrase mad. Um, I think they they're are... Desperate, aren't they? It's desperation, isn't it? Yeah, I think the question is, what, what are all their motivations and why they're trying to do it? And I don't think that's... I don't actually think that's Because you clear. said just how silly it would be to do right now. If it's that silly, why isn't that obvious to them? I don't know. You'd have to ask them. I'm sure... I... You know, who are they? I don't know. Sam, you're the one who's done the uncovering <laughs> of the plots. I just ask around. Yeah, you're the, you're the journalist here. But I think... Um, look, I do, I do think it would be crazy for the party to do that. I, I, don't, I just think all of the issues that face the country now, and, w and whichever party we're in, we mm. all agree on the issues. Mm. We all know what the problems are facing the country, cost of living, the NHS and that kind of thing. And I think spending time... And it's, we've seen it with the Labour Party that when, when parties spend too much time talking about themselves and fighting amongst each, each other, they don't win elections. And that, that's, that's the lesson from every election. Last thing, you said it depends on their motivations. 
who, who benefits from this? Well, at the moment, I would say the Labour Party. But who is who inside the Conservative Party doing this because they think they're going to benefit? Well, I, no, th these things are conspiratorial plots for a reason, and I would leave it to journalists to uncover who's behind these plots. <laughs> it's a really good try, can I just say? <laughs> you know, I feel like we've yeah, just yeah. had a glimpse, on air glimpse <laughs> of uh, the sort of persistence, shall we say, of uh, Sam Coates. It's like any crime, follow the money. <laughs> follow the money, yeah, because yeah. a bit of money's through around some of that polling that's been in the papers as well, right? Uh, very uh, interesting. Sam, thank you uh, so much, uh, and thanks for the analysis too. Now, WhatsApp messages given to the COVID inquiry have revealed just what Scotland's then First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, really thought of Boris Johnson during the pandemic. In exchanges with her chief of staff, Ms Sturgeon described him as an effing clown whose government's communications were effing excruciating. Well, the evidence comes amid ongoing scrutiny of messages exchanged by ministers and officials during COVID, as our correspondent Conigalee's reports. A warning that his report does contain some flashing images. This is what lockdown looked like. A period of pain, a period of loss, a period no one will ever forget. Four years on, this is the time for questions and answers from Scotland's First Minister, who was Health Secretary at the time. The first glimpse into the government engine room at the time. I swear by almighty God. Appearing at an inquiry now engulfed in a scandal after it emerged Nicola Sturgeon wiped her WhatsApps. Let me unreservedly uh, apologise to this inquiry, but also uh, to those who are mourning the loss of a loved one uh, that was bereaved by COVID, uh, by COVID for the government's, frankly, poor handling of the various Rule 9 uh, requests in relation to informal messaging messages. There's no excuse uh, for it. Here is the former First Minister with her then Chief of Staff Liz Lloyd. Messages between the duo are missing during the first lockdown. Some, like the night Boris Johnson announced a second wave of national restrictions were kept. Here's what Miss Sturgeon said. This is excruciating. Their comms are awful. Then she goes on to say, his utter incompetence in every sense is now offending me on behalf of politicians everywhere. You reply saying, I have a separate WhatsApp with the names redacted and Davy, and we are offended on behalf of spads everywhere. Nicola Sturgeon says he is a f***ing clown. Hi, Nicola, Hi, how are you? Lloyd was one half of a powerful pair, telling Nicola Sturgeon she wanted a Rami with Westminster over furlough to avoid having to think about sick people. Ms Lloyd, is it a betrayal that Nicola Sturgeon has deleted all I, of her WhatsApps? I've said my piece to the inquiry. That's the appropriate place to answer the questions and have nothing further to is add. Is it a betrayal, though, that people have died and there is no record of your informal messages between you and the First Minister? Well, there is. I've just provided it to well, the inquiry. Well, there are months said... missing. I have answered the questions of the inquiry. That's the responsibility. I've set out my piece to the inquiry. I hope that is helpful to everyone who is looking for answers. And I have completed my task. First Minister. He, though, may not have completed his task. And neither has the headline act, Nicola Sturgeon, who arrives at this inquiry on Wednesday in what could be her toughest test yet. Connor Gillis, Sky News, Edinburgh. Well, we can chat again to James and John. Um, John, pretty excruciating mm. messages reveals uh, from the former First Minister. What, what do you make of it? Everyone's covering their backs, aren't they? Desperately covering their backs all the way through this. I'm not sure that we're getting much um, light mm. from mm. the politicians who are providing information. From the experts, we are. And what's coming across is chaos. Mm. But I have to say, I'm not making a party political point on this. I mean, particularly around Boris Johnson in particular. There's a running theme about the chaos around him. Um, even from the officials who I, I trust more than I do the politicians on this. So, yeah, everyone's just, they're just covering their backs, as simple as that. Really. Mm. Do you agree with that analysis? Or? I, think the wide, I think there's a growing feeling with the inquiry that, look, I get, I get why these things are interesting, newsworthy, the, the WhatsApps. And I don't, I'm not sure many people would love to see their WhatsApps no, broadcast into the world. Definitely fair. But I, I do think it distracts from what the inquiry is actually looking to find out, which is to understand how you know how you can improve a response to this type of That's issue. That's why the expert evidence mm. is so much better. Mm. And I agree with John. I think the expert mm. stuff is more interesting because we don't have some of those that kind of sensational WhatsApps. 
the, the, the questioning focuses around mm. issues of the workings of government and how well it worked. And I think when we get the politicians, and it's not party political because it's, it's mm. politicians of different parties, it's focusing on these WhatsApps, which, as I said, I understand, but I don't think it really helps the sum of, you know, kind of progress and government it, knowledge. It is a bit of a problem, though, WhatsApps, right? Because, yeah. yes, government business does seem to be have been done in a WhatsApp. Westminster, I mean, like, I don't need to tell you, like, it's, it's, it's full of WhatsApp groups. Well, when you're in government healthy? like that, it's, I think what we're learning now is certain rules had to be cover that sort mm. of communication now in the way that they did other forms of mm. communication. I think that's one of the lessons that will come out of this. <laughs> Decision-making by WhatsApp has got to be as transparent as everything else. Have you guys got disappearing messages on, on your WhatsApps? Not set. To, I mean, I might do now. Yeah, I feel like this. I should do it, but I don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's true. No answer from you. I'm, I'm sure I have somewhere. <laughs> I'm sure I have. And I don't stay quiet. I, no, no, I, I'm smart. sure I have somewhere. Like half the time I can't find them, but there you are. <laughs> but anyway, and also, I admit, occasionally I, I, I do swear occasionally. And so so yeah. we're, no one's a saint in all of this. Yeah, I think that's definitely. I think fair. we're all saying we don't want our WhatsApp. Yeah, it would not be. Yeah, I, I'm very proud of that. But then I guess I wasn't making decisions during COVID. Uh, thanks both uh, very much indeed. The latest political news will naturally feature in tomorrow's newspapers. We'll have our extended press preview and news review from 10.30 this evening with tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Joining us will be the New Statements, uh, Statesman's Associate Political Editor, Rachel Cunliffe, and the former Conservative Special Advisor, Anita Botang. You're watching The Politics Hub, coming up. A new law to crack down on zombie knives, but is it too little, too late? I'm Katie Spencer and I'm Sky News' arts and entertainment correspondent. When you think of Glastonbury, it's mud you want and music. They're going to cross to us live in a minute. Okay. We always were capable of doing this. Oh, they're wonderful children as an audience. Who did that? A maverick here on the red carpet. I'm so excited. Hello. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. Nor have I ever struck any woman in my life. There's this illusion of power. Are you feeling well? I remember covering the Oscars and that now infamous moment, the Will Smith slap. You can tell from these crowds just how excited people are for the return of Fly. These actors playing the lead roles were born long after the Sex Pistols broke up. As a team, we've interviewed some of the biggest stars in the world. OK, I'll talk to you. Don't leave me. Yeah, OK. <laughs> There's no easy goodies. There's no easy baddies. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Welcome back. The Home Secretary has defended a delay in bringing in a new law aimed at toughening up a ban on zombie knives. The measures were first announced five months ago, but it wasn't until today that legislation was put to Parliament and the new law won't come into force until September. James Cleverly says he acted immediately on the issue when he became Home Secretary, but Labour and anti-knife campaigners say it's too little, too late. Sky's Molly Malone reports. <laughs> 
This is a symbolic game with a serious message. A hoop shot for every stabbing victim here in Newham over the last year. Police officers playing sports with those affected by knife violence. An unusual match to raise awareness of an ever more common crime. I lost a close friend, and then a few weeks later I lost another friend. Anthony's lost friends to knife crime and now campaigns for change. When people don't have direction, when people don't have something to do, that's when you see a lot of young people are easily influenced into doing the wrong things. But what it does is by engaging young people, you know, by engaging anybody and allowing them to be and belong into something where it's positive, where they're actually going to gain benefits. Today's announcement is about these so-called zombie knives. A long blade, often with a serrated edge, a sharp point, and sometimes words or images glamorising the weapon. We've heard for years how the government wants to clamp down on knife crime and work being done in communities like this one in East London will be intrinsic to their efforts. But loopholes in the law have been exploited, allowing these knives to continue to be used. As of September, new government legislation will hope to change that. Police will have powers to seize knives found on private property if they suspect it's being used for a crime. Previously, they couldn't do that. The definition of a zombie knife will expand to include both knives with images and words on and those without, while the maximum sentence for possession will increase from six months to two years. We have already taken uh, action to make the carrying of zombie knives uh, illegal. Uh, when I became Home Secretary, I made the immediate decision to go further, so I'm very pleased we're taking action now and will be uh, determined to get these knives off the streets. It's a cause actor Idris Elba is campaigning for further action on. I'm hopeful a campaign launched at the top of the year, two weeks later, we're seeing movement. I want the government to really think about this in a 360 way. I want youth services to be uh, reinstalled and, and reinvigorated. I want the charities that are doing all of this work for young people to be funded. There's enough money in this country that we can look at this carefully and offer some funding and, and, and stability for these organisations. And it's organisations like this one in Newham that are doing exactly that. And yet the problem, particularly in the capital, still on the rise. Molly Malone, Sky News in Newham, East London. Well, still with us are James and John. I mean, John, you must see this in your constituency, the, the impact of knife crime on, on our young people in particular. Yeah, we have. Anyone who's in an urban constituency in particular, so I, a few years ago we had a 16-year-old kill a 16-year-old in front of others, so it was horrendous. Oh, you know? And it has knock-on effects for everybody, basically. Mm. I think Idris Elba's campaign is exactly right. Um, th he talks about 360-degree approach, so yeah, banning knives by all means. The government's delayed, dragged its feet, but yeah, banning knives by all means. Mm. That's always difficult, though, because there'll always be access to some form of work mm. some form of knife. So, therefore, it is a holistic approach. You mentioned youth services. I was looking at the stats on the cuts on youth services. 4,000 youth workers laid off, 400 centers, youth centres closed. We used to have lots of street workers, youth street workers out there talking to the kids, quite close to their ages as well, so they'd be listened to. They'd be able to identify possible problems. We used to have safer neighbourhood policing as well. That's beginning to come back where the bobby would know the family mm. or they'd link up with the school, that sort of mm. thing. So it's that holistic approach. But mm. you can see what's happened. You know, we've had 14 years of cuts. So, so all those basic support services have been eroded. And the kids themselves don't feel safe on the streets. That's why they carry the knife. Mm. It's because they feel they have to be protected themselves because there's nothing there of support to protect them too. So I think... I'm hoping this campaign will cut through now. Mm. I'm hoping there'll be sort of cross-party consensus on it mm. as well so we can really, over these next few years, have a real process by which we tackle the roots of the problem. Yeah, when you talk about 16-year-old stabbing a 16-year-old, I mean, your heart just... It's just such a difficult issue. And, like, as you say, hopeful that at least that's one thing that everyone can agree on, even if the, the means to get there is, is difficult. Um, yeah, you mentioned the Idris Elba campaign, and it, it's, it is an impressive campaign. He, he's really caught something, hasn't he? I think it's a brilliant campaign. I mean, a lot of the time people come in having, having worked in the Home Office and other departments, and the way he's laid out his campaign, it's very hard for politicians to ignore him. Mm. Because it, he's, he's, he's saying, I'm not political, 
this is an issue that I'm interested in, I'm using my platform. And as John said, there's no one thing that's going to mm. completely solve this issue, mm. um, whether it's, you know, banning knives. None of, these, none of these things individually are going to do it. You know, you're going to have... It's going to have to be, as Idris says, it's mm. a 360 campaign. It's going to have to be including something on the youth level. I started in the Safer Neighbourhoods team. Mm. John Prescott mm. was mm. Prime Minister mm. as an intern. And those kinds of things which are focusing on the neighbourhood as well as banning, as well as mm. increasing... Uh, the effect, you know, yeah. making it a longer jail sentence, but the mm. punishment, all those things collectively are going to be needed because it is a real problem. We've all seen the figures. Mm. And so mm. it's, a, it's a real, it's a really, really good campaign. Yeah. Well, on the prison side, as I work with the Prison Officers Association, rehabilitation doesn't take place because there aren't enough prison officers. Mm. It's as simple as that. And so there's lessons to be learned right the way through the system now. Mm. And it is about austerity over 14 years. So let's now look at how we can properly fund it and learn from what works. Well, let's hope something works. That's the one thing we can definitely agree on. And thank you uh, both. Coming up next on The Politics Hub, we'll hear from the actor Maureen Lippmann ahead of Holocaust Memorial Day. That's coming up after the break. Hello, welcome back. Well, this weekend is Holocaust Memorial Day and it comes at a time of rising anti-Semitism in the UK and around the world. I've been speaking to the actor Dame Maureen Lippmann about its importance and why she feels there is currently nowhere that it's safe to be Jewish. Thank you so much for being on the programme today. I'm really glad to have you on. Um, Last year, I had the sort of privilege of interviewing a Holocaust survivor and it's something that's always going to stay with me um, personally. Um, 
And I know this sounds like the most obvious question in the world, but if you could just explain why you think it's so important to really mark Holocaust Memorial Day. Well, I think if you say Holocaust Day, it informs you that it's a day to focus on uh, something which needs to be remembered. And, you know, you have Macmillan Nurses Day and you have um, Marie Curie Day. And uh, this is no different. It's just a way of saying uh, Remembrance Day itself, the Cenotaph. It's just a, a way of saying this happened uh, and we need help in putting it into place and, and, and remembering those who are suffering from it still uh, or who suffered in the last war. I think it's better than um, having a, a, a bronze twisted piece of steel or... Uh, it's an educational day so that if you don't know about it, and of course people like me who were born at the end of the war uh, heard... Uh, a lot about it, but if you don't, then we're marking the slaughter, the brutal uh, murder of uh, six million Jews and I think two million uh, Romanis and uh, 200,000 homosexuals and then the disabled, and we don't know how many that is uh, precisely. Uh, so it's a way of saying never again. It's a way of saying never should a government become so powerful that it can uh, commit a genocide um, against a section of its own people, a genocide being uh, defined as um, a definite event uh, to stamp out an ethnic minority uh, and, and, uh, with intent. So it's, it's not a war of the kind we're experiencing now in the Middle East. It's not a defensive war. Um, it's, it's, um, uh, it's saying, you are tall and we are short, so we will kill you. We don't like the look of your stoop. We don't like the look of your eyes, uh, so we're going to kill you. And of course, the, the beauty of this Holocaust Day is that it takes in the genocide in uh, Rwanda. It takes in uh, Bosnia and uh, Cambodia and allegedly Armenia um, and even the Tatars uh, being kicked out of Crimea by the Russians. So when I say never again, I mean never again, I wish, uh, because we don't learn from history. We don't know history and, um, and we certainly uh, need to be educated about uh, holocausts. You say never again, and I think that's such an important phrase, never again. There has been a rise of anti-Semitic attacks in the UK recently. Do you think the UK feels like a safe place to be Jewish? I honestly think that nowhere is a safe place to be Jewish at the moment. And the UK is part of the global... Um, rising anti-Semitism uh, events, it's happening. Uh, and one of the <laughs> problems is that if you listen to the radio, and you listen to the media, you will constantly hear um, the Jews and the Palestinians, not the Palestinians and the Israelis, which kind of lets the Jews of the world off the hook, or the Jews and the Muslims, which makes it a level playing field. You don't hear that. Constantly, the Jew, and it just drip, drip, drip feeds into the idea that Jews are responsible for the ills of the world. And certainly, if, as uh, some marchers believe, if um, if we run the media, we're doing a bloody awful job, aren't we? <laughs> I don't think you would. People say to me all the time, "Oh, Israel has such terrible PR." I say. I don't think it would matter if Israel had God for their PR. It would still turn against them. I mean, this is about Holocaust Day. It's not about the war in, in, in Gaza. But it was... We were granted two days after children were beheaded and women's pregnant bellies were slit open and fetuses dragged out. Uh, two days of, of being the ones who have been persecuted, the victims, two days before 
immediately the, the world began to say, yeah, well, they kind of deserve it, don't they? <laughs> you feel that speaking out in favour of Israel, you become a target? Speaking out in favour of, of, of Jewish things, really. I, I mean, I don't know whether people realise that our synagogues and our burial grounds have been guarded by the CST. Uh, the, the, you know, we, we, we have our own um, uh, kinds of, of, of people who watch over us uh, for decades. It costs an absolute fortune. And we've had to because I can't get into my parents' graveyard without a key because people get in and desecrate it. It's, look, I'm not hugely frightened by any of this. Um, but I think, you know, after uh, events like Joe Cox, I think you can't really uh, take anything for granted. And, you know, there will be people who just don't like the look of me. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's happened. And we'll see what happens in the world. I, you know, I, I pray that Holocaust Day will not be an occasion when the haters, of this, the anti-Semites, choose to uh, come out. Because I know that all life is political, everything, um, but th this is not a political day. This is a day for remembrance of the victims and a day actually for forgiveness and understanding. I know that's quite hard, but when people take on responsibility for what they've perpetrated on other people, it helps both sides. So. I know you say it's not a political day, which I completely agree with, but I will ask you a political question to end, if you'll forgive me. Um, you previously supported the Labour Party, uh, but you then said uh, Jeremy Corbyn made me a Tory. And I just wondered if Keir Starmer has won you back round again. Yes, he's a decent man. He's a good man and he'll do his best to unite that party. But we live in the era, don't we, of 24-hour news. Nobody knew what was happening in the last Great War. Nobody reported on every single slip that President of America made. And now we're, we're afraid to, to be direct. The Corbyn thing was like something out of an Arnold Wesker play. I mean, it just happened through stealth. It happened through allowing so many people into the Labour Party for Hapney and a bag of sherbet that, that, that he, this um, man who, you know, bless him, wouldn't stand up for the Queen and wouldn't, you know, and loved to be in Russia more than anyone. You know, this man became the leader of the party we've all... Uh, that was the party of the, of, of the working class. Um, for years, and uh, we know that England is a middle-class country, and it took a Tony Blair to get the Labour Party in, um, and uh, and it took a, a war to get him out. But um, I honestly, I think <laughs> the, you know, there is a definition of a Holocaust. There is a definition of a genocide, and it is wrong. Um, of anybody in the media or out to talk about what's happening in the Middle East as a genocide. A genocide is when you... It, I'm not teaching my grandmother to suck eggs, don't get me wrong, but it is when you deliberately, with intent, target um, an ethnic group to kill them. And there are many definitions from uh, the European courts about what um, uh, genocide is, and, um, and one of them is... Um, you know, calling for the killing of Jews or the denial of the Holocaust or the denial of the Jewish state. And that happens every time there's a march. Uh, but nobody gets uh, arrested or fined. Um, and if you say from the river to the sea, you are saying, let's, you know, kill the Jews who exist there now. So, you know, it's a difficult... It's always going to be a difficult, you know, because... Their politics has nothing to do with me. When, when I was in Israel this year, uh, I was asked to go on a march against Netanyahu, and I said, no, I'm not a voter. I don't have a property there. This is nothing to do with me. <laughs> but I've been on many marches here for Burma and against Tiananmen Square 
but I don't feel that you know I, the, this 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 business of being a Jew in the diaspora is extremely complicated. But what they're doing should not really reflect on me. I support okay. the country's right to exist. I think it's an amazing country. I think the the October the seventh was heinous uh, and needed retribution. Um, and I hope it stops. I would really, really like it to stop. But every time there's a news report, the tunnels are not mentioned. How would you like to have tunnels under Coventry or Birmingham? Huge tunnels filled with weapons. Uh, the hostages are no longer mentioned. The thought of your child, Sophie, or my children or grandchildren being held in a tunnel underground by brutal terrorists is not something you can forget. I absolutely agree with that. One of the interviews that we've done on this show uh, was with the mother uh, of a um, hostage who's still being held uh, in one of those tunnels. Uh, and I have to say, it was one of the most powerful interviews I've ever done. Um, thank you so much for talking to me today. It's been great to get your perspective. Thank you, Maureen Lippman. Maureen Lipman speaking to us there. Well, we can bring in uh, James Starkey and John McDonald. I'm sure there's several things we want to pick up uh, on uh, in that interview. Um, but James, to you first, she's talking about how she doesn't think there's anywhere where it's safe to be Jewish and that she locks her parents' grave with a key for fear of it being desecrated. And it was difficult to listen to. I mean, she also mentioned, and I've got friends that have told me about this. I think it, I found it crazy, to be honest, with two young girls of my own, that there are people whose children, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, have to go to school with, with mm. protection every day, mm. you know, today, tomorrow, mm. in, in this country. Mm. And I, I think that's shocking. Mm. And, I, and I'm not sure it's... I don't think, I think as Maureen touched upon, I don't think it's as known mm. that, we've, that this community in our country has had to have that kind of protection on their schools, on the place where they bury their dead. I've had to have 24 hour protection and keep it under lock and key to go and see one of your loved ones. And that's going on every day. And it got a lot worse recently. Mm. You know, whatever your views on these things, there was a rise recently and it's got a lot worse, and it, that you've had to have protection around the synagogues and so on. And I found that deeply depressing, if I'm honest. Mm, mm. John? Yeah, it's saddening. Absolutely saddening. It's, it's horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. And we can't tolerate it. We've got to campaign against it. Um, there's Islamophobia as well. Mm -hmm. um, at the Muslim Women's Centre in my constituency, there was an arson attack. Mm. And what the arsonists did was broke in and burnt the room where the Qurans were stored. You can imagine the impact that has on, on, on Muslim women or Muslim followers. So it's, we've got to try and... We've got to tackle this intolerance. We really have. And, again, it's about sharing understanding mm. of how people are being treated at the moment, making, as James said, getting the message out there, did you know this is happening? And how are we going to work, stand together and do that? Um, and trying to share that understanding. Um, it's Holocaust Memorial Day, so this is, I agree with you, this isn't the day to get involved in the row and all the rest. I actually think the media have been covering the stories from Gaza and Israel, certainly in terms of the what happened on October the 7th. They have been covering what's happening with regard... I've seen it on Sky. You've done the interviews, both in terms of the impact of the Israeli Defence Force attacks on Palestinians. You have covered the story around the tunnels, actually. That's been quite there. So we, when we make comments... Um, we just need to be fair and careful what we say rather than make things worse. And, and on all of this, um, I think there's an onus on everyone to try and see how can we work towards peace, not just peace in, in terms of the relationship between Israel and Palestinians, but also share that peace across the world. Good point that um, she made, Maureen made, was it's important the language that you use as well. This is Israel and Palestinians. This is not Muslims and Jews. This yeah. is not that at all. By I any thought means. that was an important and point. It, well, and it's interesting. I have been at various vigils. I was at a vigil up in Harrow last week and all the rest of it, and beside me was an Anglican. Mm. 
and then as a Jewish speaker, and then there's a Palestinian. That's the way forward. We do it as a united way. And we show the suffering that's engaged by all people and how do we come through all of this. Did you want to come in on the Jeremy Corbyn? I don't think point? that was fair, what Maureen said. Look, Maureen resigned her Labour Party membership under Ed Miliband because of his, his position on recognising Palestine. And Ed was our first Jewish leader and I found that extraordinary then. I think Jeremy really did his best to try and, first of all, expose his anti-Semitism both in our party and wider. He tried to set up mechanisms for dealing with that. I think we were hampered by our own bureaucracy. We were involved in coups against us, would you believe? We were hampered by our own bureaucracy, but we tried to overcome. Mm. So I don't think she was fair. But we've always said that the stats showed, actually, that the anti-Semitism in the late part numerically was very small. Mm. But it didn't matter. If there's one anti-Semite, it doesn't matter. If there's just one, too many. And, of course, there was... Um reports into it that raise concerns about it at the time that I'm sure you all... And, and we've set up the structures yeah. to be able to deal with. The first party that did that as yeah. well. Um, I was quite moved by a lot of what she said. And, you know, it does... It's, I think it's important to, you know, reflect on the day and the, like she says, the kind of centuries of yeah. uh, anti-Semitism uh, that Jewish people have uh, well, the experienced. The point well. she made was as well... The Holocaust Memorial, what the, the organisers of all of this have said it is about other genocides as well, yeah. Rwanda and others, and how you learn the lessons yeah. from those. And although she said, you know, this issue around Gaza, etc., we'll see what the, inter the ICG, the court, says about the genocide or not. But actually, you learn lessons about how to treat one another and the suffering that goes on when you go into those sort of actions in which civilians and children in particular get and, killed. And the point that you were making earlier as well about the fact that, you know, people don't feel safe in our communities if, if taking their children to school, um, burying their dead, and actually, you know, it's something that I've reflected on a lot as a, as a journalist as well, the responsibility yeah. to all, yeah. uh, everyone has been fairly uh, represented. Thank you uh, both. Coming up next on The Politics Hub. Well, as the political journalist Paul War reveals he wants to be an MP, can our panel identify other famous poachers turned gamekeepers? To be honest, when I started, it wasn't really about any particular angle. It was just this really cool new thing to do. I was obviously a big Usain Bolt fan at the time. So there was a part of all feeling like, oh, I'm a sprinter just like him. Yeah. I mean, you have to thank God for great people around you. My really good friend, Ben, I mean, I was quick at school and that kind of thing. And he was like, look, you've never given this thing a go. What are you, what are you waiting for? Give it a go. And, and that was literally how I got into it. And here you are. You run um, sub 10 seconds yes, in this event. Uh, you reached the semi-finals of the World Championships. As I said, ranked fourth on the British 100 metres all-time list with 9.93. To qualify for the Olympics, what have you got to do? Because looking at that... You're within touching distance. Amen. Um, yes, yeah, so you've got to run qualifying times 10 flat. You know, the small matter of going to yeah. our national championships. Smash and that, yeah. <laughs> small matter of going to the national championships and coming in the top two, top three. Um, and then, yeah, job done. Sealed. <laughs> I had to work full time because, you know, you've got bills, life, mortgage, yeah. nursery payments. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in a situation now where I can see my coach a little bit more. Um, but look, I don't... People may look at it and think, isn't that distraction? How on earth can you balance the two things? I very much look at it as a competitive advantage in the sense that, look, I'm fly I also feel like I'm flying the flag for civilians, normal people working a nine to five, yeah. letting them know that, look, it's all possible. You know what I mean? You have a little bit of faith, a little bit of belief, yeah. um, whatever hidden talents that you're sitting on, you know what I mean? Whip it back out and, it. and go after it. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. That's what I'm flying the flag for. You know what it is? It's going to sound massively cliche, but you just take that first step. Yeah. And then the next one will take care of itself. And then the next one, and the next one. And then before you know it, you're tearing down the athletics track by the sub 10 seconds and 100 metres. You know, but no, it's honestly as simple as that. You'll never know if you never try. I think it would be, it's like a dream beyond a dream. It'd be mega. I often joke that I'll get the Olympic rings tattooed on my forehead. <laughs> and that'll probably be the end of my corporate career. Um, just because it'd be that kind of, but yeah, I think it would be a great sort of impactful, inspirational kind of story. I'm not a gatekeeper of any sort. So I just love to share and hope that it will catch someone inspired by someone, but no, it would be mega. So God willing, we can make that happen. I'm Mark Stone and I'm Sky's US correspondent. Is this the moment to reform gun laws? 
we aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. I'm playing devil's advocate. Mark Stone, Sky News in the United States. Hello, welcome back to the Politics Hub. Now let's talk about poachers turning gamekeepers. The veteran political journalist, Paul Wall, that's who this person is, if you don't recognise him, is the latest in a long line of hacks who reckon they could do better than the incumbents in the Commons and throw their hats into the ring to become MPs. Now, Paul has said he wants to stand for Labour in his hometown of Rochdale, saying it's time to stop being a spectator and start being a player. Well, it's on a well-trodden path, so we thought we would <laughs> test to see how well our panel of James Starkey and John McDonnell can recognise some famous hacks turned politicos just from their writing. So do have a go at home as well, if you can. Now I'm going to read you go on. this quote. This was written by a journalist who became an MP. They fired their rifles, pressing their muzzles into the very bodies of their opponents. They cut bridle reins and stirrup levers. They would not budge until they were knocked over. They stabbed and hacked with savage Penisacity. Penisacity. Is that how you say it? I've got. <laughs> per, I've got. I've got a feeling this is a while ago. It uh, is a while ago. So it's sort of ch early Churchill. Church. Very good. Awesome. Was it? Very good. It was Winston Churchill. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Sounds a bit like him. That was Winston Churchill in the Morning Post in 1898. Wow. wow. There you go. One nil to you. <laughs> uh, this is the second one. So long as men are content to believe that providence has sent into the world one class of men saddled and bridled and another class booted and spurred to ride them, so long they will be ridden. But the moment the masses come to feel and act as if they were men, that moment the inequality ceases. Who do we think that was? It's Labour, isn't it? It is Labour. Yeah. You all know better than these famous yeah. Labour journalists. Well, I'm trying to think, someone like straight to your... Evan or something like that, I can't think. It wasn't Woodrow White, was it? No, it was a very, very famous member of the Labour Party, the founder, Rock in fact, Keir Hardy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, at the age of 31, he founded a newspaper called The Miner. Right, we're going to try and rattle through a couple more of these because okay. we haven't got sure much got time. One, one, what, squeeze one more in, right. The Berlamont Building in Brussels. Boris. Head court. There we go, Absolutely. very good. Yeah, yeah. Boris so Johnson in, in the Daily Telegraph. Yeah. And I think we're out of time. We did have Michael Gove as well. Oh, um, oh did you? Sorry, <laughs> we're just out of time. Good, that was pretty good that. performance, Should've I have to say. Hard, <laughs> Thank you both uh, for uh, <laughs> being good sports for the quiz as well. Well, that is it from us tonight. I'll see you tomorrow at seven. Up next, though, it is the UK Tonight with Sarah Jane Mee. We'll see you next Monday at 7pm. See you then.